Hello everyone. Welcome to the fourth edition of the Artist Intellectual Series, which is organized by the NUS Chinese Studies Department. This is a series that aims to foster conversations between the arts and academia, because often we operate within our own discursive silos and miss out on the kinds of knowledge production made possible when we reach out across disciplines. My name is Alfian Saad, and I'm the resident playwright of the theater company Wild Rice. Today, I'm very excited to moderate this panel called Ecological Entanglements. As many of us have observed the climate crisis and other environmental urgencies, such as habitat loss and mass extinctions have engendered a range of responses in Singapore, from publications to exhibitions to social movements. Among these, we can include books such as Timothy Barnard's Nature Contained, Environmental Histories of Singapore, Ethos books, Eating Chili Crab in the Anthropocene, and Making Kin, Ecofeminist Essays from Singapore, as well as NTU Center of Contemporary Arts, Climates, Habitats, Environment. There were also the National Library Board's exhibition called Human X Nature in 2021, and the formation of the NGO Singapore Climate Rally in 2019. Our two artists today will discuss how ecological themes have informed and inspired their practice. We've had a few visual artists on our panels, and as always, I'm excited by the kinds of novel and innovative frameworks and vocabularies that they can share with us from the field of visual culture. In short, artists often gift us with new ways of seeing. I think this would be crucial for us as we confront the most pressing issue of our time, which is how to heal and save the planet for the next generation. This will be the format for our discussion today. We will start with the artist presentations, which will last for 20 minutes each. And then we will move on to a discussion with our guest interlocutor today, the environmental historian, Dr. Faiza Zakaria. She'll respond to the presentations and also have some questions for the artists. And then we will open up to the audience with a Q&A. If you have questions for the artists and the interlocutor, you can type them in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. And then we will wrap up at 5.30 p.m. And now, please allow me to introduce our first presenter. Zarina Muhammad is an artist, educator, and researcher whose practice involves a critical re-examination of oral histories, ethnographic literature, and other historiographic accounts about Southeast Asia. Working at the intersections of performance, text, installation, ritual, sound, moving image, and participatory practice, she's interested in eco-cultural and ecological histories, myth-making, and haunted historiographies. I love that. I love the alliteration there, haunted historiographies. Okay, so um, Sarina, uh, let's steal your presentation. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Elfian and uh, Huiken for kindly inv inviting me to speak at this webinar. Um, okay, let me just share screen. Okay, so, um, so today I'll be sharing, um, as the title of my talk suggests, tangential points from a long-term and ongoing constellation of a collaborative research project uh, looking into environmental and eco-cultural histories. So this project so far has been led by several things, the subterranean and watery radial modes of pathways created by um, the migratory flows of bodies, um, thinking of traversing the seen and unseen, um, you know, again, also thinking about flows of goods and capital through these migrations, um, flows of the immaterial, spectral and speculative, so through this work, my key collaborators, namely playwright performer Joel Tan and musician graphic designer Zach Yu Chan, and I meander, walk, and talk, and engage with questions of territoriality, place histories connected to the vast webs of islands, water bodies, spiritual landscapes that have survived urban infrastructures. So through this work, we continue to explore embodied memory as archives, seeing soil as a system of burrows and tunnels, trees as vessels and nodes, infrastructures overlaid on spirit paths, the survival creation of wayside shrines, um, the sacred meanings and ecological significance of say earth mounds, for example, apotropaic acts associated with itinerancy in habitation and ways of engaging with the landscape's potency. And in the course of this ongoing work, um, I'm continually reminded of the gentle nudging of these words by anthropologist Anna Singh, who writes research categories developed with the research not before it. Um, so we're always sort of reminded that, you know, these sorts of ethnographic, autoethnographic approaches that an artist might take where we're playing with distance and intimacy and um, should always be seen as, as an in-process collaboration with all of these multiple elements that are around us, uh, very often non-human. So much of our process um, is often led by being attentive and attuning oneself to space. 
by instinct, intuition, and chance. And a key prompt motivating um, a lot of my work through the years has been asking questions that stem from leaning in to consider, listening in on how to construct, especially in spaces of art, um, the meeting of different forms of knowing, of understanding, respecting, and being present with the more than human and non-human through our senses and bodies. And you know, I often say that in, in all of the work that I do, I think it's very important um, to extend gratitude to and acknowledge all of these non-human creaturely companion species guides and um, what I perceive to be guardians of a lot of these spirit spaces, spirit paths as co-authors um, who offer many lessons and who also um, I see as you know, um, figures that, that we learn to, you know, we're learning together to circumnavigate, negotiate, um, accommodate and redraw new thresholds um, in these quiet, often quite quiet entanglements. I also owe other lessons um, on attentiveness to texts such as Alexis Pollengram's Undrowned, Black Feminist Lessons from Marine Mammals, where she asks, what is the scale of breathing? You put your hand on your individual chest as it rises and falters all day, but what is the scale of breathing? If the scale of breathing is collective beyond species and sentience, so is the impact of drowning. The context of undrowning, she says, is breathing in unbreathable circumstances. And that's what we do every day in the chokehold of racial, gender, gender, ableist capitalism. And every day we are still undrowning. So um, yeah, I just really like just how she also talks about listening across species, across extinct, extinction, across harm. And um, I'm just gonna just read out another quote from um, her chapter on listening, uh, where she asks, how does echolocation, the practice many marine mammals use to navigate the world through bouncing sound, change our understanding of vision? and visionary action. This is where we start our trans-species communion, communion, opening a space to uplift the practice of listening even more than the practice of showing and proving and speaking up. Listening is not only about the normative ability to hear, it is also a transformative and revolutionary resource that requires quieting down and tuning in. So um, I pick out that quote because I thought it was a nice contrast to just another sort of point which I'm often, often thinking about when I'm thinking about you know, attentiveness and listening. Um, and this is just, I'm just gonna read a very short quote from um, John Locke's 2010 book on eavesdropping, um, where he writes about how animal behaviors basically have been, you know, um, documenting eavesdropping as they, yeah, eavesdropping as they study birds, fish, lizards, and other species. Um, and eavesdropping is communication and it has two features that make it unusually interesting. The first is that it feeds on activity that is inherently intimate. Um, and a second feature that makes eavesdropping so interesting relates to the way information travels. It is often, it is not donated by the sender, it is stolen by the receiver. So just some things that often sort of, um, you know, remind me as in, in the course of creating any, any, any work. So um, lessons from threshold crossing, traversing, unearthing, and drowning um, within restless topographies, um, as the title of my presentation also suggests. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, and and sort of yeah, looking at these you know um, unruly, sometimes singularly indeterminable spaces have emerged as a recurring thematic points in many of my works in the last decade. Many of my curiosities have been formed by the many lessons drawn by lines plotted by animal navigation, trickster, trickster tides, submerged reefs, and maritime arteries. I've often described my practice and way of thinking approaching the world and its relational entanglements like a multi-headed hydra, a multi-point constellation, mostly because I enjoy the polyphony of multiple interpretations, the vexations of translations, mistranslations as well, the impossibility of translations, especially when working collaboratively across different modes and mediums, and with, as I've mentioned many times already, human and non-human co-authors. So many of my works begin with this provocation of questioning the efficacy and economy of these acts of translation. And um, I also think, I mean, feel that um, a lot of the work that I do in its various incarnations um, have generally been very much interested in the cumulative nature of stories, um, acts of storytelling, world building, and the labyrinthine vexations associated with embodied knowledge and the act and power of naming. So how can we decenter how can we decenter hierarchies of these knowledge systems and attune our senses to multi-radial tangents of local, scientific, ecological, cosmological wisdoms, alongside vernacular knowledge from the point of view of the human, non-human, more than human, and perhaps even human-made? Um, how can art offer expanded spaces for knowledge making and multimodal forms of knowing, sensing, listening, and naming? 
Um, so I'm going to speak a little bit about the video that I shared, um, the one titled Earth, Land, Sky and Sea is Palimpsest. Um, so this particular project, uh, the, the video that you viewed um, is, I guess we saw it as a first iteration and prologue to a much um, longer, longer term body of work. Um, and this was first developed with Saikri Chan in 2020. And the work pursued departure points pertaining to the leveling of hills, earthworks, landmarking, spirit ecologies connected with soil, earth mounds and subterranean spaces. Um, we've described the work as invitations and invocations to see with skin, hear with our feet, feel our way through spatial interruptions, and somatically attend to sound at points of transit, change, and threshold crossing. So the first iteration composed of three short video essays uh, titled Whispering Secrets to Trees, The Poetics of Moving Earth, and Terra as Palimpsest. And they were all, we saw them as invitations again to remember, echolocate, distance, sense, give attention to, sit and walk with the various forms, shapes, guises of non-human worlds, the spirit loci, the creatures and trees that are older than our buildings, um, and to listen to songs, to movements, um, to any vibrations that bounce off spaces fringed with trees or hardened by concrete. So um, Zachary and I returned to the neighborhoods we both grew up in, um, and which you know I think not too long ago were fairly dense secondary forests and swamps in the 80s, um, and went on several slow walks seeing how it, it had all changed. Um, some of these walking paths we took meandered through three specific sites. Um, the first site that you see here would be Tupayo, uh, which I mean, some of you might, might know is that Singapore's second satellite town developed in 1964, um, you know, from, from marshy swampland and where in spite of urban redevelopment, um, tree shrines and, and earth shrines such as what you see here um, still beckons pilgrims and devotees. I think just to also add, um, you, I don't know if many of you noticed that in many of the shots there were cats. These were all accidental. We did not place them there. Um, and I think this is what I also enjoy in this process of um, the work that we do, where you know we welcome all these serendipitous sort of actors that come in. Um, so. Um, I mean, 1963 to 1971 signaled the reclamation of the Kalang Basin with um, some 400 hectares of swampland filled using earth taken from Topayo. So we were really interested in sort of, um, yeah, thinking of the, the movement of, of, of these hills of earth um, across the island and, you know, beyond the island and, and earth that's also taken from neighboring countries that come onto this island. Um, but, you know, for this first iteration, we were, yeah, looking at Topayo. The second site um, would be Amokyo Garden West Park. Uh, where we encountered by surprise um, this scarred rubber tree inside a clearing at this forest turned park behind my childhood home. Um, we attempted, you know, listening with our feet and shouting into drains to sense, sounds, to sense sound paths below the ground, outline as our cackles and chatter bounce, broke and diffused, smooth, dissolved tree spaces that we couldn't see. And there's also the motive of, you know, us placing um, the kainkapan, the funerary sort of shroud cloth um, in some of these various sites. So in the third site, which is the Japanese Cemetery Park, um, you know, where we were sort of intrigued by these um, and had questions about these uninscribed irregular rock forms, um, which were essentially markers as, uh, for the graves of the Karaiki san, the comfort women who never made it home um, and were, were buried in Singapore. Um, you know, while we acknowledge that, yes, you know, there were, you know, famous generals like Tani Yutaka, the Tiger of Malaya that were buried there, um, but we were a lot more sort of interested in the unmarked graves, the lychee tree, the, the rubber tree, uh, possibly planted at the end of the 19th century and, and clearly older than many of our buildings. Uh, we were you know, interested in sort of walking through these um, spaces within this site um, and attentive to, I guess, the exact spots where our hair stood and where we viscerally sense um, a sense of grief. So, um, so for this uh, particular iteration, uh, Zachary and I were responding to the prompt of how the pandemic, this was made in 2020, 2021, um, had reframed the forest. So how, had the, how has the pandemic reframed the forest? Um, the idea of sacred geography and our relationship to land, if it did at all. While we can argue that computation systems have enabled forests to be made legible in new ways, we had unanswered questions on the unofficial users or memories of our green spaces the multiple and broad breadth of intelligences that mark, these, mark and shape these spaces. Intelligences that have the capacity to sense light, temperature, electricity, sound, resources, predators, pathogens, parasites, intelligences that take up space in these crevices that we may overlook or not notice. Intelligences that also move beyond the binaristic way of thinking about nature and machine, organic and inorganic, digital and analog, magical and scientific. So um, as a sort of continuing, um, 
sort of development of this project, um, uh, we sort of roped in Joel Tan and uh, three of us have been, uh, along with you know other invited collaborators, um, working on this uh, new project. I mean, it's sort of like a continuation. Um, and recently we uh, did a um, artist residency at the Girth Lab for three months, uh, where we were sort of developing work, which um, we are currently setting up at the Singapore Museum. I'll share a little bit more about that in a, in a short bit. But yeah, so I'm yeah, happy to speak more about just um, this, this work uh, later on. Yeah, where we were sort of also working with um, fermentation jars and yeah, thinking about blockages and, and things that are clogged and choked within our island. Um, so just a sneak peek of what we're setting up. Um, so we made a, basically the work is going to be um, a um, installation, but also have a essay film uh, within within the work. Um, and I mean, we've sort of described the work as a prayer, a spell, an archive, and a space making intervention. Um, and you know, we're really trying to trace these restless topographies of of land scarred by imperial past projects, imperial projects past and present. Okay. Um, so you know. In an island city state like Singapore, what is our present day relationship to the land, to the earth, soil, to creaturely forms in all of their guises, to the seen and unseen, to habits, to, to habitats that have been created by destroying others in relative close proximity? What are the entry points from which we can talk through and listen to the ways knowledge is produced, transacted, transmitted, consumed, perpetuated, handed down, orally documented, decontextualized, stolen? And uh, so since early 2020, in the early mandarins of this project, um, I found myself being extra observant and strangely enamored, as you would probably see in the video, uh, by these drain holes that you see here. Um, another name for them are weep holes, which refers to the small openings on the retaining wall that allows water to drain and escape. So apart from drainage, it also provides ventilation. And I was just interested in how the possibility that like insects, snakes, mice uh, might be able to gain entry or exit um, through your home. Uh, which you know, I perceived as these kind of interesting subterranean portals, um, you know, as, as sort of these human-made and exit entry points that compensate for the many river mouths that we have been that have been sealed shut or made concrete due to land development. So I encountered um, these weep holes when I was out photographing, uh, making sound recordings um, near and around termite mounds um, for you know for this project, and they weren't immediately obvious at first sight, but I was again drawn to these crevices appearing as these like exit entry points on these seemingly impenetrable brick, stone, concrete walls and human created structures. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, the lesson, I guess, for this, if I have time to just ramble a little bit of tangent here, um, is, sorry, sorry, Ooh, where did it go? Okay. Um, is that, you know, a lot of uh, presentations I've been doing since in the last two years have, have often not failed to mention this, this manic spirit destroying act of doom scrolling, um, surely exacerbated by this pandemic. So, um, you know, I think the lesson I felt, I felt that these weak holes were offering me at this, at this time was perhaps a reminder that in most stories, films, the moment the protagonist reaches the dead end, this brick wall, something significant, surprising happens, um, unexpected escape routes, other turns of possibilities present themselves. Um, which I thought, you know, was a much needed frame of mind in this in this pandemic and living in a city where space and respite from noise is a luxury not accorded to everyone. So just very quickly, these questions followed me through that work and continue to resurface today. How do we bear witness to what we may not fully understand in any given moment? How is the world speaking to you today? And how have you established ways to feel safe? So for many of us whose practice is research driven, collaborative, participatory, requiring communal presence, how are we listening to each other? to our surroundings, our environments, our bodies, to reconfigure rhythms of time and disembodied sounds from virtual realms. How are we unlearning, relearning, and renegotiating our relationship to time, to routines, to spatiality, presence, and bodies in space? And what invocatory technologies of the present are lending themselves as these new planetary questions and shape-shifting worlds that we're building and creating every day? So I suppose, you know, um, so the cause of this work, I mean, I was I mean, in the cause of this work even if until uh, today, right? Um, I've been asking myself what landmarks from the built in natural environment still exist in our mental and memory maps, mental memory maps. So maps, as we all know, have functioned to serve pragmatic means. However, we were interested in, in reimagining cartographic forms, retracing of desire paths and making earth drawings from memory maps as a manifesto, walking as a form of intervention, as a love letter, as a, as a way to visit trauma, to meet with all ghosts and perhaps be one. Uh, walking is a method and as a, and, and as a way to reflect on the question I've asked myself time and time again, 
can ghosts and gods die? And is their survival dependent on the frequency in which we say their names and make images of them? So I'd like to end my sharing, I'm coming to an end here, um, with two meditations um, on my own experiences with ecological entanglements, uh, my own sort of um, preoccupation with being quite attentive to space, um, spaces of art making, just all of these different spaces that are physical and, and not. Um, and so the first one um, on, you know, oh, sorry, yes, okay. So the first one is um, actually on, um, yeah, leaning in, listening and reorientating our, our senses to space. And the second sort of meditation will be on the love and gratitude for I have for a particular um, animal. Okay, okay. Zarina. Yes, uh, sorry, am I running out of time? No, you actually have five minutes late, uh, left, <laughs> so you don't have to rush. You can yeah, take your time. With these Thank two. you. Okay, sure. Thank you so much. Okay. Good, good. This should last five minutes and I'll read slowly. Um, okay, so um, meditation number one. Um, on the last new moon of December 2021, which also happened to be a solar eclipse, at the invitation of researcher Marcus Ng, we made a little pilgrimage 4 km south of the main island of Singapore to Terumbu Pandan, known for her vast seagrass meadows and living reefs. So situated at the crossroads of major shipping lanes and petrochemical industries, she emerges during very select lowest tide hours. So with luminous orange vests on, we jumped into the open sea, into water that was slowly receding, and within the hour, Jerumbu Pandan emerged from the sea and allowed us to walk her shores. Once known as an important landmark for deep water passage to the Keppel Harbour, she has, she has, as shared by Marcus, lost her land, lost over time her land, trees, and name, a name that obscures her connection, significant, significance, and stories to the Malay world. So for slightly over an hour, this peculiar habitat permits the briefest of companionship before she wills the sea to swallow her back in again. Okay, and lastly, I'd like to end um, with this image of and a tribute of thanks to a wonderful non-human companion who has serendipitously showed up in all of the walks that I do from forest walks to intertidal walks, quietly swooping in and alerting us to their presence with their signature strident rattling call. Um, this little friend also uh, made a most recent appearance just yesterday morning at 5 a.m., just before I boarded the boat, the boat to Pulau, to Pulau Hantu. So this inhabitant and guardian of the sky, earth mounds and water bodies has taught me many important lessons on determining and divining portals, traversing and traveling with a whole body listening, for which I'm very grateful. So for the pakaka. Flitting about waterways and wetlands, the kingfisher, the pakaka, cackles and whistles. They hunt and favor watching as motionless as possible from elevated perches. They nest in tree holes and arboreal termite mounds, and they are associated with calling and charming the winds along the coastal and riverine areas. The woodlands, parklands, mangroves, plantations, suburban roadsides, rocks, tropical rainforests, canals, and lampposts. They thrive in spite of anthropogenic disturbance, occupying habitats across radial distances of 16,000 16, kilometers and are known to move with ease across sky, sea, and land with the ability to see underwater. It is said they share kinship with the Garuda, the Chindrawasi, the mythical bird of paradise, their faces on hilts of daggers, and their beaks pointing outwards in the direction of the prevailing winds. Legends tell the story that they were the first to fly from the ark, or that they were, they were the first, that, or that the first kingfisher was a human trickster how they are charmers, psychopomps, foragers, water bearers, shapeshifters that take on the form of a Dwarapala or a wrathful deity. The kingfisher sits and waits, cackles and whistles, remains at ease, at ease in their transience and offers lessons on digging tunnels to nest in, diving with your eyes closed and creating pathways for habitable universes. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Serena. That was such a fascinating, and dense and multimodal uh, presentation. Yeah, so uh, right now I want to call on our next presenter, presenter artist, uh, Kairudin Wahab. I'll do a brief introduction before this starts. Yeah, Kairudin Wahab's paintings weave narratives drawn from cultural geography and environmental history in Singapore and Southeast Asia, working from archival materials, found images, and iconography from his geographic and cultural context. Kairidin creates visual tableaus that allude to our histor historical political encounters with the natural world. His most recent works explores the intersections between disenchantment and re-enchantment. Okay, Kairidin, whenever you're ready, yeah? 
Okay, thanks for the introduction and thank you for inviting me. Uh, let's just... Yes, so this, uh, I'll start the, my presentation with this painting I did in 2018. So my, my kind of, like my interest has always been kind of looking, looking at the, the environment of my, kind of my social cultural environment. And I've been interested in, so this painting is, is depicting uh, this Southeast Asian art form called Silat. And we, we, I mean, today we know Silat as kind of like a more of a uh, kind of sport or like a, like a martial art form, but it's, there's actually more to it. And there's, uh, to me, it's kind of like a microcosm of the Malay culture because within Silat itself, there's like uh, practices, for example, like traditional healing, uh, mysticism, uh, spirituality and also uh, the kind of self, art of self defense. So uh, I see, I see this. There's this whole dimension of silat that's kind of been lost over over time. And so if this painting was basically kind of the start of uh, what led me to my current research right now. And <clears throat> so this this painting, particular painting, depicts this uh, ritual called. Uh, mandi minyak. So mandi minyak is is a Malay term in English. You would translate it to like oil bath. So so this is like an illustration of uh, what mandi minyak would would look like. It's it's basically literally like a cauldron of like hot oil that that they would boil and like the kind of students would would kind of lined up and one by one basically kind of uh, rub it all over their body so so this is kind of like a, a way to test their their faith in in the in the practices and the teachings and also to kind of uh, i guess it's it's like it's a rite of passage for people who who do silat in this particular uh, form of silat because it's actually uh, silat itself is it, not like a it's there's many forms of silat and and different different silat practices have different kind of uh, philosophies or approaches to this martial art form. So so when I was looking, I was researching into this kind of practices. Uh, I guess I, I started to realize that there's like different different dimensions of silat kind of is rooted in this kind of uh, pre-Islamic animist uh, practices or beliefs. So what we have in Silat right now is a syncretized uh, kind of version of it because over time as kind of the, the like modernization, industrialization, like this, the, the practices have developed and, and I mean, with the arrival of uh, like is Islam and other faiths, uh, these kind of animistic roots become, uh, they get absorbed and syncretized into these practices. So, that's when I that's when I kind of uh, thought about like the the roots of uh, our kind of cultural practices and and where it came from and how it kind of got here today. So from this uh, kind of painting, I, I got into looking at uh, animism. So I was I was researching into animism in the region and and how it it's kind of developed over over time. So, so as I went about and, and looked further into it, I, I realized that uh, as in animism itself is, is kind of like a reverence for uh, a natural world. So whatever is around you, like there's a kind of spirit or there's, there's a kind of mystical uh, entity to it or quality. So as I kind of read further into it, I, I realized that most of it have uh, kind of roots or ties to uh, the natural world and obviously the, the natural world in in the past and the natural we have now is is a totally different kind of environment so 
kind of trying to chart the, the development of a practice and, and its ties to the environment. So like in the past, like CLAT was actually quite, uh, quite a common practice uh, in Singapore. And you even have a uh, big kind of, uh, call, they call it like gelanggang, but it's, it's like, a, like a courtyard where, where CLAT practitioners would, would kind of uh, train and, and do battle. So, Today, there's, there's uh, kind of a road called, I think, Silat Road or Silat Avenue where it kind of commemorates the history of this place. So, and Silat, Silat practices used to be kind of, uh, and it's, it's common in the community. So, like you would, it's not uncommon to, to hear like your, your uncle or cousins or what taking part in it. And, and usually the, the Silat guru, they kind of occupy, or they wear kind of different hats. So, a Silat Guru would be like a traditional healer. They would also be uh, like uh, a, religious, uh, a religious figure. So they kind of uh, operate within this uh, realm where you, they are like dealing with different aspects of, of this kind of uh, practice. And so that's, that's really the, the roots of uh, where my research into disenchantment, re-enchantment begin. So from from there i it led me looking into uh, the environment and kind of our our beliefs or perception about the environment so i guess i, I started to like i mean in, in my kind of uh, lifetime i've already kind of noticed that uh, the, the the kind of landscape around me has always been in flux like since i was young uh, like i've seen like forests getting cleared like the hills being flattened uh, and like the coastline kind of expanding so like the, this kind of natural environment here has always been uh, changing constantly and i guess that kind of uh, made me reflect on this relationship between the the natural world the environment and and the people and kind of the cultural practices and beliefs and that's where I kind of, uh, I guess, kind of stumbled upon this, uh, this term disenchantment, which is uh, which originated from uh, Max Weber. So he, I think he's an 18th century like sociologist, and he, so this this idea of disenchantment is is rooted in this kind of uh, so during the Enlightenment age in Europe, uh, when kind of science and rationalization was the was on the forefront of, uh, uh, I guess, understanding the, the world around you. So there was, it was a way for the society to kind of uh, go against traditional uh, ideas or against like, the, or like separation between like church and state. And so it's about kind of uh, being skeptical and kind of questioning the ideas that, that is around you. So. Uh, in the context of this uh, climate in Europe, uh, Max Weber kind of uh, coined this term like disenchantment. So disenchantment of the world is like kind of, to put it, I guess, in a, in a sentence, is like a, a demystification or desacralization of knowledge. So uh, dem demystification of the world in a way. So uh, I guess things that used to be seen as uh, like... Uh, something that is originated from uh, like the gods or like something that was mystical is kind of not really uh, taken kind of seriously in, in like this kind of climate where you, you see science and uh, rationalization as, as the way to understand and process you know, the surroundings. So, so from this kind of context, I was looking at how uh, disenchantment can be applied to kind of uh, Southeast Asia as a region. So disenchantment, I guess, came to Southeast Asia through uh, colonialism. So colonialism brought about, I mean, besides, uh, you know, like all the cash crops and uh, commerce and trade, it also brought about new ideas and ways of looking at the world. So try to imagine, I guess, uh, 18th century uh, Singapore uh, and when the British came, they brought about all these new things, new ideas, and 
I, I guess I was trying to uh, kind of imagine the, the arrival of uh, kind of these uh, Western ideas and perceptions and how that translates to like a Southeast Asian region that is the, or that used to be uh, animistic or like early Islamic. So, and how this kind of interaction can uh, change or kind of bring about new perceptions or ways of seeing the world. So, so with that, I, I, I made this uh, new series of works uh, for my last exhibition, which is called uh, The Word Forward is Forest. So that the title is from uh, a, a novel by uh, uh, Ursula Le Guin. Yes, Ursula Le Guin. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, so she's a science fiction writer and, and the book uh, kind of uh, touch upon uh, this kind of uh, eco-colonialism and uh, some themes there that I, I read that I felt like could have some parallels with uh, what I'm, the, the ideas I'm working with. So this particular painting uh, is called Land Without Soil. Uh, it's, it basically depicts a, a, a kind of person with a theodolite. So uh, theodolite is this uh, land surveying tool that is used to kind of, I guess, plot the, uh, the, the planes of the, the space, the land, and try to measure you know, where, where you want to put or how, how do you want to build whatever it is that you, you want to. So I see, I see the, so I see the Teodolite as this uh, symbol of this enchantment because so this enchantment uh, can kind of manifest in different ways. So it's like, so being a surveyor with a Teodolite, I see it as a way to kind of, uh, so when you survey the land, you, you use uh, kind of mathematical planes to see the world and what, whatever that is kind of, you know, the history, the stories of, of the place is, is not really, it's not really relevant to this whole uh, process. So kind of like mapping uh, cartography is the, the kind of act of mapping is, is a way also to kind of uh, enforce or, or kind of put or control the, the land that's, that's surrounding you. So it's a way to basically understand what's, what's surrounding you, the topography of what's around you and also to it's when you kind of redraw the, the you know, the maps and the, the lines, the boundaries, it's this kind of no, 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 you don't really take into account the, the kind of history or the stories of the place. And I guess in the context of Singapore, where when the first kind of Raffles town plan was created, he, I mean, he kind of have this, uh, this master plan of having different settlements uh, where the different kind of racial groups would stay. That, that, is, that is a way kind of to uh, disenchant the place because you, you're kind of enforcing your ideas on the place without uh, kind of acknowledging, you know, what's, 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 in the, what's on the land and, you know, the people that are living there, the history. So, so this painting was basically kind of trying to explore this idea. And it's part of the, the, the reference was actually this, this print that I saw it's, uh, it's quite famous. Uh, it's by Henrik, Heinrich Leutmann. So it's, it's about a, a, a scene where uh, there was a survey going on and then there's a, there was a tiger that kind of jumped out of the forest and attacked the, this whole exercise. So... Hi, you have uh, five minutes, yeah. Okay, so yeah, this, uh, this was kind of the, the, the inspiration for this creating this work. And next is, is a work that has a till the ground. So till the ground is, so the, this, this painting is kind of touch on different aspects of what I, I kind of consider uh, various processes or means of disenchantment. So uh, this was kind of looking into taxonomy and how taxonomical ways of, uh, you know, seeing the world and cataloging the, the nature that around you is, is also a way to, you know, demystify uh, this, this plants or creatures and you kind of see it from a, a more scientific lens. And so this scene was like a, it's like a classroom and then this, this figure that is teaching uh, something. So it's like, it's like an, ag it's an agricultural botany class. So 
the figures here are kind of like in the classroom and this uh, act of learning and kind of uh, demystifying, you know, uh, what's, what's natural. Finally, there's this, <clears throat> this work that I titled A Variation on Things Imperfectly Known. So this was also one, like when, when colonialism came to like the region, uh, naturally, like naturalists uh, from Europe would come and in order to, you know, discover new lands and discover new creatures and plants. So in this particular piece, I, I was reflecting on the kind of the knowledge systems that's been built up and how uh, like usually like the indigenous kind of body of knowledge has, has always been kind of the backbone of uh, this uh, naturalists who come to uh, Asia to, you know, like Wallace or Darwin, they would have uh, local guides to kind of guide them. There's, there's always, uh, you know, like an exchange of knowledge in this context, but uh, obviously in, in the kind of the, the research that they've produced or published in Europe, uh, I think doesn't really, I guess, acknowledge this aspect of uh, like this uh, indigenous uh, body of knowledge. So this, as you can see from the, the painting, there's kind of like a specter of paint, a figure it's invisible beside this uh, clearly colonial kind of naturalist figure. So this, this was the kind of uh, ideas that I was looking into in this particular work. And the title itself is, is I guess, a reference to uh, taxonomy. It's like uh, that you kind of catalog and there's this various uh, things, butterflies or animals or plants. And it's, it's, it's catalog within a, a kind of rigid structure, but uh, it's, you, you don't really kind of, I guess, know it uh, in the way that you, if you kind of study each individually. So it's, it's like, you know a lot of things, but it's, it's, it's imperfectly kind of uh, each kind of, uh, not each animal or each creature is, is known by a particular set of system that is often not really, for example, like indigenous knowledge would have certain like myths or, uh, you know, medicinal qualities of a, of a plant. So it, it's not really kind of fully knowing what is it that you are kind of studying. So yeah, with that, that's basically what my work's uh, been about. So yeah, there's this kind of exploration into uh, this enchantment and I guess the re-enchantment part comes uh, kind of when you're, I'm trying to recreate the scenes and also to the, the other paintings that that I, I've created that kind of explore this re-enchantment aspect. So, yeah, that's, that's my presentation. Okay. Am I on time? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> yes, you are. Thank you so much, okay. uh, Kai. Uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, when you met mentioning uh, the Malay martial arts form, which is called Silat, I was actually reminded that uh, of the use of two terms in Silat, mm. which is uh, they will say bunga silat, bunga is flower, and buah silat, right? Yeah. And, and I thought that that's, a, that's an interesting link with the, with, the, with the vegetal or the ecological. So, so the bunga are foundational movements that are displayed by the martial artists, often involving the slapping of different parts of the body, such as the shoulder or thigh. And then the buah are elaborations of these movements, and they are used in sparring and actual combat. So I thought, you know, when you mentioned just now about how these forms are perhaps like influenced by the environment, I thought this is actually one very interesting example of it. Hmm. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we're going to move on to the discussion and I will now call on Dr. Faiza Zakaria. But before we do that, I'm just going to give a brief introduction. Faiza Zakaria is Assistant Professor of History at Nanyang Technological University. She received a PhD in history from Yale in 2018. Her research and teaching interests are in the fields of religious and environmental histories of modern Southeast Asia, with a focus on conversions, sustainability, and environmental justice. Her forthcoming book, The Camphor Tree and the Elephant, Religion and Ecological Change in Maritime Southeast Asia, will be published by University of Washington Press in December 2022. Look out for it at the end of the year. So let's uh, over to you, Faiza. Hi, thanks a lot, Alfian. And thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and especially, of course, to Zarina and 
Haridian for sharing. This is also my first time uh, hearing about your works in a sort of sustained way. I have been to an exhibition of Haridians and also um, viewed some videos of Zarina's, but this is my first time hearing them speak about uh, their works. And it's been a very exciting and enriching um, talk. Thank you so much to you both. Um, I think that uh, what I'll do, since um, I cannot, of course, pretend to be any sort of expert on art, um, is to basically um, summarize some of the uh, key points that jumped out at me at these um, that I found exciting um, in your presentations and the way that um, you speak uh, both about your work as well as about uh, nature. And then I'll pose um, two questions, which you are perfectly free not to answer. And we can also then um, open this discussion up to um, everyone else who is here. So um, let's start, I think, with um, Zarina's work and the um, exciting ways in which she tackles this question about basically how does art offer multimodal forms of knowing. And I love the fact that Zarina's talk kind of takes us through her experiences of walking and um, showing really that walking was, as she put it, a kind of letter that is co-authored by humans and non-humans. And the way that uh, we may understand this world then involves not only thinking about the material, but also thinking about the connections that the material has to past memories, to past histories. And that is a crucial part of Zarina's work. And I thought it was fascinating that even though the central um, conceit here is to um, deal with the question of entanglement, um, Zarina sort of anchors us to her experiences by using binaries, by thinking about human versus non-human, organic versus machine, drowned versus undrowned. And the juxtaposition of these binaries then enable us to um, explore entanglements um, more closely. And that is a very um, interesting move because it's not just about thinking about binary as oppositional states or pick two choices to pick, but as polar ends of a spectrum and complicating, I think, the spaces in between. And that is a beautiful part of what um, Serena has presented to us today. So the idea of Terra as Palimpsest then brings us to the, um, to the notion of how landscapes become a space for writing, rewriting, and overwriting particular memories. And um, listening to Zarina's talk reminds me of Marion Hirsch's um, concept of post memory, which I think um, comes up beautifully in some of the, the ways that you described some of the terraforms that you explore, um, where what we are now trying to access, what we are now sort of walking through, um, is the relationship um, to personal collective cultural ruptures and traumas of the past, of those who have come before. And to experience what um, we are trying to, what we're trying to remember now is only through images, stories, and trace really of behaviors um, where we want to grow up. And this brings me to a question that um, I think we might ask of both speakers then, um, as Harudin also, as I'll talk about, about in a while, also speaks about rupture. In this moment of rupture, in this position of post memory, then, um, what kind of images can form, can coalesce as a history? And is that a transmissible form of history? Do you see the kind of art that you're doing in some sense as, um, his, um, as histories in the making? I'll, I'll be curious to know your, your thoughts about that. Um, which brings us, I think, to the specific rupture that I think Haridin was um, addressing in his work. And he starts, I think he brings us through um, uh, the step that he takes from Sila to nature. And when you think about um, Sila to nature and the kind of common thread that um, runs through both um, is the notion of animism or the kind of broad idea that um, the inanimate or the, uh, or the non-human could be animated by um, spirits. And um, what happens is a kind of two parallel forms of rupture, one in nature and one in culture, um, which is in some sense um, highlighted by the ways that some of the practices um, in such as Mandiminya, for example, um, become something that's seen as a remnant, becomes something that's no longer um, truly um, uh, 
spiritually in tune with the landscape of today. And that is the kind of disjuncture that's also um, present in the way that we think about nature as well. How then do we um, spiritually commune with nature if we don't quite um, view it the same way? And what Hyrodin's works um, in the Word for World for Forest that um, sort of captures this um, a moment of rupture, I think, is this attention to the different kinds of tools that enable us to think about how to measure, how to rationalize, how do we systematize an understanding of the world. And Tilda Dyke, um, as this kind of rotating telescope for trying to measure kind of horizontal and vertical angles, for in a sense, being able to see both above as well as broadly, right? Um, gives us this, um, um, it becomes this what he sees as a kind of symbol of disenchantment um, because of the way it purports to enlarge our vision. And that's a very sort of um, interesting um, way of thinking about this because in a sense, what um, you may disagree with me here, but what I am sort of in a, in a sense getting from your work is also this feeling that the more we see, the more we feel to the, the more we actually uh, fail to comprehend. And that, is, and that is one of the tragedies in some sense of um, the environment, the moment of um, today. So in some of your works as well, we think about specimen cards, we think about how we can now um, put our vision um, to work in, a, um, in various, in multiple scales, but these scales might not necessarily um, bring us to knowledge that has eventually has meaning. So um, in that sense, then um, we might then want to question when we put, or when we think about both Serena's work as well as Arudin's work, where is the place then of specific cultural identity um, in this more than human and in some sense naturally, uh, necessarily diverse um, landscape? Um, I get a sense from Arudin's work at least that there is a, there is a um, nostalgia in a sense for a specific um, Malay world of the past and that the way that that Malay world has related to nature. In a way that to some extent I don't quite see in, in Zarina's work. So there's a very interesting um, juxtaposition there of um, thinking about culture as either um, specific or broadly sort of um, related to a kind of worldly, worldly way of relating um, to nature. So I'll, I would also love to hear thoughts about that if you want to share them. Um, and lastly, maybe I'll just end off since we started off, I think with, um, at least the poster, at least started off with Anna Singh. So coming back to, I think, to the idea about the you know, mushroom at the end of the world, and the thinking that without stories of progress, the world becomes a terrifying place. And it's terrifying because the ruin glares at us with the horror of its abandonment. And as she says, we can still, but we can still catch the sense of the latent comments. And this is what I think both Hyrodin and Abzarina's work sort of um, just, just to, uh, it brings us a sense of what is possible um, within that sort of uh, landscapes of ruin that we are um, currently living with. So um, in that, in a, in a sort of final question then, in a way, how do we think then about re-enchantment as um, Hyreden has pointed out, how do you recover the spirit, acknowledge the non, uh, acknowledge non-human life, recover kind of awe at power beyond the human and recuperate the value of unpredictability in life. Think that all that comes up to parts of re-enchantment in some sense, um, the parts that we would need to access. So I will stop here and open this up for discussion or maybe just for Hyrodin and Zarina to um, join in and uh, comment. So thank you so much for your work, it's been amazing. Thank you so much, Raisa. Okay, so uh, to our two artists, do you have specific questions you want to respond to or would you like Faiza to like repeat some, some of our questions that are directed at you? What's, what would you like? Uh, I can respond to <laughs> some of the gentle <laughs> points yeah. that my multi-headed Hydra picked up. Um, thank you, Faiza. Thank you. These are very wonderful, thoughtful questions. Um, I liked what you said about the more we see, the, the more we fail to comprehend. Um, I'm reminded of that every time I go out walking. Um, and like I said, a lot of like my process is really like walking and talking. And I suppose 
trying to think also about culturally specific ideas of the senses. Because so for instance, like for the Javanese, uh, walking, uh, no, the talking and feeling are uh, extent of valid forms of, of, of the senses um, beyond the five. So, um, and I mean, I think just to respond to your comment on us thinking about, you know, artists as, as in the work that we create, are they also like histories in the making? How are we engaging with this idea with historiographies as well, these haunted historiographies? Um, I feel like for me, I'm a lot of my work um, has this running sort of thread where I'm constantly thinking about ways to destabilize the voice of the single storyteller, the voice of the single artist, the voice of the single, um, you know, uh, researcher, etc. So how can we kind of open up for these more polyphonic discordant spaces where it becomes they, these multiple interpretations where I suppose, um, you know, I, and I'm, I'm constantly sort of also thinking about these, uh, the shadows of, of writing, of images that that we are working within as artists. Mm -hmm. And so for instance, when you know, um, Kai was talking about uh, Weber, I was instantly thinking of like, you know, how he talked about unmagicking, you know, and eliminating magic from the world. <laughs> um, and I mean, come back to what you also said, Faiza, about um, the juxtaposition of certain binaries. And, um, and I guess, you know, a lot of what, of, of me also situating these binaries is also not to see it as this or that. It's really, as you said as well, I'm um, thinking about the, the, the spectrum of it or, or thinking about what lies beyond these, these keywords uh, because words are also can embody limitations in, in, in the ways of in which they could also fail to embody um, translations in its sense. Like sometimes I think about the word magic and how it may not translate neatly in a lot of Southeast Asian languages. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, that is a good that is a good point. <laughs> so, <laughs> just, is, yeah. yeah, without that sense of uh, actually in some sense without a sense of humanness, right? Without like see here for example, yeah, 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 yeah. the the kind of human actor. So that's a yeah, a good point. Uh, I, I I'm I think I need you to repeat the, some of the questions. <laughs> Sorry, <anyway. laughs> yeah, yeah. It's just... a, I guess there are basically three questions in a way, and um, which. You are perfectly free to kind of go off and tangent on. Um, okay. The first is thinking about um, art as, as, a, as a form of history making, as in mm. the, your art um, as contributing to a particular conversation in historiography. Um, and um, secondly, the um, idea about um, wait, let me see, oh, uh, the place of specific cultural identities, I think, um, in uh, more than human um, and diverse um, landscapes. And um, lastly, thinking about the role of art, I think more about recovery, um, the enchantment of the natural world. Um, if that is something that is um, recoverable, then um, how is that best done? And maybe that question, um, maybe to put it in some context, I have heard uh, maybe arguments that. Um, the best way to access, I think, the kind of wonder at and awe in nature is not through, um, is not through thinking about a kind of regression to the past or past modalities of um, knowledge, but through science itself and kind of peeking through, for example, the way that we enable um, a certain form of vision and the way that we now can see things that um, we previously could not access might lead us to a renewed sense of wonder about how we're all connected. So, um, so there are various ways of thinking about this, of course, but uh, the, the role of the rational, I think, um, should that be discounted when we want to think about it in general? Okay, okay, sorry, yeah. While Kai processes some of these <laughs> questions, okay, I, I would like to invite the audience right now. You can start uh, asking your questions in the chat box if you have any, yeah. And then uh, and when we open it up to, to the audience in, in a couple of minutes, uh, we'll try answering some of those questions. Great. I, I, yeah, I'm not sure in the sense we do have uh, answers to some extent, but just points of views that you would really like to share. Yeah, I guess the, the first one was about like history, like make, history making, like art as a kind of way to, I guess, contribute to the kind of historiography. Uh, I guess, yeah, that's like art is a way to, you know, offer this kind of, uh, I guess, not really mainstream or like common really perception of how to, you know, see certain things. So, for example, like, you know, this enchantment in the world and how <clears throat> that relates to cultural practices today. It's, it's, it's not really something that you, you know, you, 
naturally would in your mind link. So mm. this uh, I think that's what that's also uh, what I think Zarina's work kind of touches on like a lot because there's a lot of kind of uh, material there that is is kind of interesting and not really often thought about. And I guess that's a way to. Uh, this is, I guess, art is a different kind of uh, body of knowledge that it has its value in kind of, you know, sharing certain ideas and how it links to, you know, like environment to, uh, you know, enemies practices to, you know, enlightenment age in Europe. So, yeah, that's, I guess, it, it has kind of a, a place in history making, I guess you would say. And yeah. what's the last question? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I guess in terms of the ways in which we may recover. Oh yes, uh, hmm. in <coughs> Recover. Let's see. Yeah. I maybe you know, on a more personal level. Um, you said that towards the end of your presentation yeah. that the working through, I think those paintings hmm. um, enabled you to, um, in some sense, become re-enchanted with the world. Could you share a bit more about that? Right, yeah. So I guess some of the things that I'm, I'm, my references are like uh, textiles or like, I guess things that I see as uh, uh, disenchantment or like this notion of disenchantment, re-enchantment manifests through material culture. So mm -hmm. things like, you know, batik, for example, is, uh, it's got its roots or most of the motifs have kind of spiritual or, you know, mystical kind of meanings. But uh, once it's kind of made into like a garment, a nice skirt or whatever you you know, there's something is gained, but something is also lost. And and when you take this textile into, you know, like specific context, like you maybe wrap it around a tree, it it, be, it attains, you know, a different sort of context and it becomes almost like a sacred thing. So uh, there's this always, I guess, a, a kind of a vacillation between like disenchanted and re-enchanted. So I think, and these are the kind of uh, materials that I guess, uh, I, I work with in, in my work and I reference. So uh, I guess it's kind of a way for me to, you know, I guess the painting itself is, you know, making it is, is a kind of, you know, re-enchanting all these themes that I'm, I'm interested in. 